What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Planet Soccer Podcast here on YouTube. Uh, I'm your host, Reed Simpson, along with Dylan, as always. I tried to do it on my own last night. You guys are never going to see that episode. That thing will never see the light of day. It was so, so awkward talking to myself. Did two takes. One was 12 minutes, one was 14. I watched it back, and it was painful. Dylan, you're out in Florida right now. You played around maybe two rounds of golf today. Um, how's everything going down there? I'm in Disney World, which for me, those of you that don't know, is one of my favorite places. I'm here with the, the future in-laws and, and my fiance. Played some golf this morning. Also one of my favorite things. So I'm feeling good. A couple beers deep in my room after a nice day of golf. Getting to talk some USMNT. Getting to talk some Jesse Marsh. Loved it while it lasted at Leeds, yep. but it, it, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm excited to, to kind of dive more into the USMNT options. We had a, a really cool episode yeah. recap in the March March break, so it'll be kind of nice that, that gained some traction thanks to all the new subscribers. Um, so what we're kind of going to do here, and, and you can probably touch on a little too, in the next, I don't know, week, week and a half, we'll probably profile five to seven of, of the coaching candidates. Um, and I'm super excited to that. We were able to briefly touch on a bunch of guys we were interested in, but really dive in and, and give USMNT fans an idea of, of what the next step might look like. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, we are going to start with Jesse Marsh. I think when you're looking at the next U.S. coach, um, you kind of have to have in the, in the back of your mind that Burhalter is still an option, um, although it, it feels like he shouldn't be, I feel like, to most people at this point. Um, if you're looking at the candidates, you, you line them up, say you line up the top 10. I couldn't find betting odds for the next manager for some reason. Um, if you line them up side by side, 10 guys, the, the guy at the, front of the, at the front of the line for most U.S. M&T fans um, is naturally going to be Jesse Marsh. Um, on the surface level, at least, if you look at it, it's a perfect fit. He's coached a bunch of these guys that are on the team, will be on the team. He's obviously American. Um, he got caught saying we when he was analyzing the USMNT in the World Cup. When he was still a couple employed times in by Qatar. Leeds. <laughs> when he was still employed by Leeds, yes. By the way, I'm drinking a Twisted Tea for all of our England fans. I'm having my tea time right now. i got to go back to work after this also. Anyways, yeah, so Jesse Marsh, he's, he's got to be um, at the forefront of everybody's mind. Who is Jesse Marsh? He's a 49-year-old from Wisconsin. Uh, he's a Princeton man. Probably pretty smart, I guess. Uh, I didn't know Smarter that. Smarter than us. Played midfield for the... – <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're both Tigers, though, right? Princeton Tigers, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Um, he played midfield for the Tigers from 92 to 95. Uh, Bob Bradley was actually his college coach, so um, – He's kind of grown up through the American soccer ranks, youth soccer, college soccer, and then he went the MLS route, uh, played in North America for 13 years, finished his career with Chivas and Liga MX, uh, spent the rest of his career in the MLS with D.C. and Chicago. So he's considered the United States probably best con continental coach right now, I would say, um, as far as where he's been, what he's done. He's coached in the Champions League. He's coached in the Premier League. He's coached in – multiple big five leagues and then Red Bull Salzburg, which is, you know, we just finished March Madness. If you want to talk mid majors, they're like one of the best mid majors in European soccer, I would say. Uh, maybe not one of the best, but they're, they're always going to make the tournament, you know? So Dylan, right off the bat, you think Jesse Marsh, what do you think? You want him? You don't want him? You're not sure. What do you think? He's, he's probably my favorite safe bet. Um, and I don't even know if safe is fair, like on the field, we can, we'll dive into it more. There's some questions on, yeah. on is he adaptable, adaptable enough formation wise? Um, is he too Leipzig uh, or, or too Red Bull ingrained in his coaching career at this point in time? But, but on the surface, the, the players he's coached on a club level, the American ties, it, it seems like the safest no brainer option. Obviously, there's more attractive, sexier names out there, but he, he's kind of a nice hybrid. I think he would excite the fan base um, for sure. Um, I think there's a lot of people in the fan base that would that would be very um, passionate about about the hire, but it's not necessarily that 
that that super sexy European hire or or South American hire that we've kind of flirted with at times um, in, in that previous episode. Yeah. So I, I think he's kind of the best safe option. And knowing USMNT, we like going the safe option a lot of times. So for me, with like realistic options, I he he would be at the top of my list, probably top two or three. Yeah, um, definitely top two or three. Go, kind of going through his background real fast, how he came up through the coaching ranks. Uh, his first gig was an assistant under Bob Bradley during the 2010 World Cup cycle on the US men's, for the U.S. men's national team. Um, from there, he had a short stint with Montreal. Um, interesting little story about that, kind of ironic also. He ended up leaving after one season. It was Montreal's debut in the MLS. Um, he had a relatively good year based on expectations or compared to expectations but it wasn't an ideological fit. Montreal's board wanted to bring in more experienced European players to compete now. Jesse Marsh wanted to build up that organization with continental talent. Um, so they ended up parting ways. After that, he um, he actually went back to Princeton. And it took me a minute to figure out where he actually <laughs> went from 2012 to 2015. Because uh, it didn't show it on his Wikipedia page, but he did go back and he coached Princeton was obviously successful enough there to get right back into the MLS and get into that Red Bull system like you talk, like you talked about. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Red Bull system, they own, I think, probably two dozen teams across the world. Every continent, um, they own teams in the, the, the big five leagues. They own teams in America. Um, and he was with New York Red Bull. Very successful at New York Red Bull. Ended up lo- leaving them as their all-time winningest head coach um, after just – two years i say it was only two or three years it wasn't weird. super long yeah yep um after new york red bull he he made the jump to europe uh he took a demotion if you will if you even want to call it that uh he moved over to red bull leipzig which is the top tier of the red bull uh football program and he was an assistant under ralph ragnick who he's probably a familiar name to to many of you um but one interesting thing from what I read in several at several sites, uh, Jesse Marsh actually kind of ran training and he ran opposition tactic reviews. So he was in charge of match preparation, essentially, uh, for Red Bull Leipzig. And he, he left a, a pretty big impression because after Red Bull Leipzig, he ended up getting the call to head up um, Red Bull's probably number two team, which is Salzburg, uh, the Austrian powerhouse pretty much winning that league every year. He was uber successful at Salzburg as he would be expected to be. Um, And then we get to the interesting point of Jesse Marsh's career. He gets the opportunity to go back to Leipzig and be the head man following none other than Julian Nobelsman. Um, We talked about him several times here recently, the prodigious prodigy, whatever, how, whatever the correct, um, way to say that word in the right context is the German coaching prodigy. That is Julian Nagelsmann coach of Chelsea. Um, it, it's looking like <laughs> it. It is looking like it. Um, Sorry. A really tough guy to follow, a tough guy to follow from a name perspective, a tough guy to follow because he was German in a German league with German fans, probably the most important, or I'm sorry, the most significant hurdle that Marsh had to face is, the tactics that that Nagelsmann had Im- implanted in uh, Red Bull Leipzig. It was much more of a possession-based system, uh, whereas Marsh likes that more chaotic pressing system. So he struggled it. He struggled at Leipzig. Uh, he lasted like four months, five months, I think. Um, was out of the job for a while, then headed over to the UK, uh, to the United States of Leeds. And Dylan, I'll let you start saying some words here. Um, it was a really, it was, it was big shoes to fill. Um, Bielsa was one of, in recent memory, the most um, attractive names, attractive, successful success stories in a way at Leeds. Um, so it, it was a, a very big role to fill stepping in for a uh, Marcel Bielsa type, type, type character. And he was able to do so. Yeah, an, Ar- an Argentinian who you know has the pedigree on the national or on the worldwide stage, and England fans respected him. And they, you know, being Argentinian, I think 
you know, I'll, I'll have more of this later, but I think ultimately it, it came down to England just really didn't want an American in there. Anyways, continue. But but he did have uh, more more so going back to, to his, his time, Bielsa's time at, at Leeds. It was um, he he gained promotion for them and and de- yeah. decent performances at top flight for, for a year or two. Um, but nevertheless, our lad Jesse was brought in um, to ideally take that next step. I think it was uh, not only big shoes to fill, but it was – um, a, a little bit of a an issue with style at times as well. Um, he also typically plays a, a fairly attractive brand, and and we've said time and time again, Jesse is more helter skelter, crazy pressing. Not not that Bielsa wasn't a, a pressing manager, but but the the more the with possession, um, it was just more of an attractive brand of football, and, and I think. Um, a, a lot of times in a lot of English sides, you can probably speak to this as a Spurs fan, fan bases are half as concerned about attractiveness of play style as they are with results. Um, because you, yeah, you, you can argue that, that Jesse had a decent amount of success for, for what was given to him at times. Um, I mean, they started out phenomenally this year. Um, fin- he finished strong last year. Um, stumbled a little bit after the World Cup break. Um, so I, I do think it was one of those situations where it wasn't an attractive brand of football um, internal or internally within the fan base, I should say, somewhat of a controversial hire bringing in an American um, in such a storied fan base, storied club like Leeds. Uh, a lot of times American football for right or wrong is, is kind of looked down upon um, overseas there. So there, there, it was a short leash he was on. It was always going to be a short leash that he was on. Uh, and I, I think it was a lot to ask for him to do much more than he had done leading up to uh, his firing in February. Uh, but I, at the end of the day, I, I do agree. I, I think it was primary, not primarily, but a lot of it had to do with his nationality because of the type of football he chose to play combined with his American phrases at times, his American persona in a, in a more storied club like Leeds. His style, his, it, just his, his like literal, literal like, like everything style. about him was just yeah. not Leeds. It just didn't fit Leeds. And you and I on and off air have talked about like who fits Spurs both tactically and physically. Marsh was like the opposite of all of the things that fit Leeds at Leeds. So I, I do think he had a really short yeah. leash. It was something where if, if they weren't in the top 12, uh, at an X, X point of time, it seemed like he was going to get the boot regardless. It kind of seemed like he was going to be a transitionary manager. But I think he did a, a fairly good job with what he was asked to do and what was put at, at he his He kept disposal. him up. Right. You know, he, exactly. he kept – he inherited leads in 16th place. Uh, they finished in 17th. But, I mean, he he, he and, had a crumbling back line that he had to work with. He had a – you know, his best player was obviously on the way out and Rodrigo – um, yeah, right now. And, also, or Rafinha. I'm sorry, Rafinha. That's the second time I've done that. Rafinha. I mean, Rafinha. They, so, yeah, <laughs> he, he lost his best attacking player. He didn't, yep. wasn't able to stabilize that back line. It seemed like financially until January. And then he was given, what, two matches after the window? And then he canned him. Yeah. And, and he inherited a 16th place side, and they're in 16th place right now. Like, yeah. They haven't regressed. I, I even if they were twelfth, they'd be four points off right, relegation right. because you got not eight, nine teams in the Premier League that are two losses away from sitting in twenty. So we we talk a lot um, about optics, and it seemed like an optics firing to me. It was a uh, we we can't have yeah. this American even close to leading us into relegation, uh, or we're going to lose our fan base. And and right or wrong, uh, I, I know Leeds as one of the more passionate fan bases in England. So I, I understand mm-hmm. trying to appease to a fan base like that, but I do think if if like if he was at Southampton and was having similar results based on the type of fan base and the type of club, he would still be a Premier League manager. Uh, so in some yeah. respects, tying it back to USMNT, we're almost in a way if if he is the next. Oh hire, yeah, that's what we're talking about. If he is the next hire, we're almost lucky that he was at Leeds because he would still have a job at four to six other Premier League clubs based on the job he's done right now and based off of where he was – given the team he was given when he took the job. So from a USMNT side, yeah. it's super frustrating seeing our best, best international coach 
get such of a short leash, but if it leads to him being the US MNT coach, then maybe maybe there's some plus a plus side in that. But I do agree. I do think a lot of his firing had to do with him being American and the team he was he was working for. Yeah. Um, getting into Jesse Marsh's style, what would he bring to the United States men's national team? Does his style fit the roster? Um, and could it be a long-term deal? Would it even happen? Jesse Marsh employs primarily a 4-2-3-1, which we should all be singing praises to high heaven because of that, because that's exactly what, what this roster yes. needs to play. Um, it's, you know, it's three behind the striker that play fairly narrow. It's Polisic inverted. It's either, you know, Wea or Aronson or Reina on the right. And then, you know, ideally Reina in the middle, obviously. But um, it's it's a style that would really fit the roster. And I, I do, one hesitation I have is that there are a lot, there's, there's a lot of um, pressure or a lot of responsibility put on the left back in this system in, in particular, at least when he was at Leeds. Um, just the way the midfielders dropped back, it ended up being where the, the left back, uh, he tried Jack Harrison in that role a couple of times, but with you, USMNT, you have Anthony Robinson and uh, Anthony Robinson's going to have to get better in tight spaces on the ball if you want if he wants to play a good left back under under Jesse Marsh because he creates what Marsh's build up does is it creates a basically a triad of passing um, between the wide midfielder, the number 10, and then the fullback on either side. Um, and instead of one of them making a run off of each other, it draws the center back in thinking that one of them are going to make the run. It obviously draws the fullback. And that's when you bring in your ace, Florian Balogun, who fits this system so well. perfectly, perfectly to look for that through ball, which is what Marsh's teams like to do instead of, say, the 10 making a run off of that triad of passing. So it's a style that fits that, that fits the team um, it, it fits the, at, at first it glance. It fits the potential team. I think a lot of yeah. that attacking presence is who is our striker. And, and I, I talked about yeah. in our March episode, one of the, the draws for me to Henri is securing Balogun. I know there are plenty, and we've had some comments in the past, like, hey, let's not bend over backwards for this 20-year-old showman, if you will, that, that Balogun's kind of being called at times based on his his tour of America in, in March, going to all the sporting events, getting the VIP treatment. He's not even a USMNT player. So, like, I get not wanting to bend over backwards for him. Um, we would all do the exact oh, same thing if we yeah, were yeah. If we and were he, being and, wooed yeah. by anybody an, in the comments. Come if we're back, being wooed by an entire yeah. country. Come back and comment again yeah. and tell me how you wouldn't, and I'm going to call you a liar immediately because we would all do the same yeah. thing. Um, but but that is another aspect to him is is if it is a system which it should be that appeals to Belgian, it's more enticing to me to bring Marsh in. I think those are um, that's one of the, the pros because we don't have a striker that really fits a whole lot of any type of system right now. So if Marsh fits our best prospect striker, I, I'm, I'm open to, you know, I don't know a better way to say this, but whoring him out a little bit like, Hey, come, come to this system because we hired this manager. Jesse will be the guy yeah. to take you to that next level. And, and because of the style, I, I do think it would help us land a, a guy like Val again, which at this point is, in my opinion, extremely important. Yeah, and even beyond Balogun, let's talk about somebody that is in the system, and that's Gio Reyna. You look at what, I'm, I'm getting the name right this time, Rodrigo, like the current Leeds Rodrigo, in that number 10 role, played phenomenally under Jesse Marsh in that system. He was one of the top goal scorers in the Premier League for much of the first half of the season. Um and that's kind of the role that Gio Reyna would play. So it'd be exciting to see how Reyna would flourish in that system if if Marsh was the guy. Um, will it happen, Dylan? I mean, he right. I have my notes on here that I'm going to say, but you, you you can give me what you think. It, for me, it would have to be the odds-on favorite right now. Like if I was, really? if I was, I mean, obviously I'm not as tied in as Vegas. Um, but if I was Vegas yeah. based off of my knowledge, he would probably be my favorite right now. And and that Which is obviously just immense yeah. immense knowledge right. the both oh, of yeah. us have. We know everything that is happening in in, yeah. in and around the, the organization. Um I, I, I do think it's a little early to really be able to tell though, because we don't even have a director right now. 
Um, so I think the director will be a pretty key indicator on what route everything plans on going. I do think it's still going to be another month or two. It's a little frustrating um, not having somebody in place right now, but it is what it is. I think the, the key indicator will be that director when it gets in place. But that being said, not knowing the director, he would be not my personal favorite, but my betting favorite if I was setting lines on, on who I think would be the next hire. If he wants it. And that's the other thing. Are, are we, are we going to be talking about your, are we, is your favorite one of the ones we're going to do an episode on? Probably. Like my personal? Yeah. Don't say favorite, it. But... Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Just want to make sure we, we get that in for you. No. Yeah. I think you, you're right with the sporting director or the lack thereof. Um, but Jesse Marsh played within the organization. He coached within the organization it, there are people above a sporting director who could make that hire. And my question is, if it were going to happen, do it with just do it without a sporting director. Like, why hasn't it already happened? And, and my, for, it's for, kind of the same question that for, that you had with Nogglesman. Why hasn't he gone to Spurs yet? Um, for optics, though, like if you think to Americanize it, which it is American sports, even though it's soccer. Um, to yeah. Americanize it, though, like you would never, if you fire your GM in football, you fire your GM and your head coach at the same time. The odds of you hiring a head coach before hiring your GM and then telling your GM, you can. I don't only... think that's apples to apples, though. I don't. I don't think that's a complete apples to apples comparison. It's the closest comparison. Because you know you're I not got. drafting. You're not. The, you're not signing free agents. The, you're not. It's the closest comparison you're not doing I got. But yeah. But I. I, yeah. I do think it would be tough to because if you are asked to, and, and granted, if if most people in American soccer were asked to be the new sporting director of USMNT, regardless of what they tell you in your interview, you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that job. That's sweet. But for the most part, sure. you would want some control over your program. And if you're being asked to come in and, and this is your coach, we've committed X number of years to this coach, go with him. That's a lot less appealing if, if your end goal is to hire the best sporting director and the best coach or manager for the program. I think you have to go sporting director and then manager. Um, but yeah. but I, I do think there are certain coaches, Jesse Marsh not being one of them, that we could jump the gun on and, and we'll jump into those types of, of hires in the future. Um, some very bigger European cachet names. I think we may be willing to jump the gun on, but a hire like Marsh, who again is the sexiest safe hire, I think would have to be done with the sporting director already in place. I'll concede some lack of knowledge here and say, I don't know how sporting directors work globally. Uh, at the international level, I know there are a lot of clubs and a lot of managers out there that don't want a sporting director around. But I don't know what the what the difference in roles is on the international versus the club, you know. So who knows? Um, why would Marsh say no? You might ask. Why would he not take the job? Uh, it feels like he would, but where he's at in his career, it would feel like a bit of a step back. It would feel like a optically, I think it would, um, especially across the ocean, it would look like he's conceding defeat in, in Europe for the time being. Um, I think realistically, you know, we always have a more American sports, American franchise mindset on it. I think it's way more of just a reset, you know, get his feet back under him. Um, and lead his country into a home World Cup. However, we have to remember what those guys in London um, writing for whatever Daily Mail or whatever they write Trent for Crane. over there. It's, yeah, <laughs> the independent. Um, there, I think it will be framed as a kind of heading back to America with his, uh, his tail tucked between his legs, which would be hypocritical because unfair, yeah. if we get said names that are not said names with the names that we're going to mention uh, later, it would be a very different narrative. Right. So it would be a very taking a know. chance to, to grow their coaching career. And so the, the one thing, the, yeah. the rebuttal I'll give to a step back in his career is where else could he had? I only have one current opening in mind and it opened in the last 24 hours, 48. I'm on vacation time. It might've been, even more than 40 in the last Lester. three days. <laughs> yeah. Like, Le Lester is yeah. the only place that if Lester is interested and USMNT are interested, 
I wouldn't blame him and I would not be surprised if he went to Leicester. Um, Mm -hmm. With that being said, if Leicester goes a different direction, I I don't know what else he can do. Would you rather, I mean, it's not currently an an opening, but by the end of the year, it could be. Would you, would you rather a relegated Southampton or would you rather USMNT? Like, and I think that's kind no, of I mean, the level think, he's at if he doesn't secure a yeah. Leicester type position. It's like, what else in the Premier League can he do? Does he really want to go back to Germany? Does he, like, wh- what what other options are out there for him that are more attractive than your home country hosting a World Cup in three years with the best, most talent this country has ever seen? Leicester to me would probably be a little bit more attractive, but outside of that, I'm also very prem biased, but outside of that, like what what else is out there that's more attractive than this? And it can be very clear for him taking this team through the World Cup, and then I'm out. Then I'm going to Europe. And that's See it. you later. Yeah, and that's it. And I think US would be fine with that. I think he would likely be fine with that. So I, I don't think it has to be a step back in his career. Um, if he were to choose this over Leicester, I totally get why the paper talk would be running back to the States with his tail between his legs. Cause Hey, why don't you want another shot at the Prem? Um, but outside of Lester for me, yeah. it isn't a lot more attractive of an option for him right now. Yeah. And you know, we do have to keep in mind that there will be jobs that open during the summer. Right. Cause that's kind Absolutely. of when the frenzy happens. And at this point, one just off the top of my head, hiring before, <laughs> before the summer yeah. firings happen. So that is, that is certainly something yeah. to keep in mind. I know. I know the Frankfurt coach is a candidate for a lot of jobs. He's been he's been mentioned for the Tottenham job. I think if Frankfurt opens up, Marsh would at least be a candidate. Uh, that would probably be best case scenario. I think for a club yeah. a club team in Europe. Um, but yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comments about Jesse Marsh. Um, obviously, there's a lot to be said. This will probably be our longest profile on one of the candidates. Um, he's very fresh on our minds, and, and we love Jesse. You know, he's he's the United States soccer's favorite uncle. Um, he's the yeah, one his, he his interview at the parties. World Cup, you already touched on it. His interview at the World Cup about what he would do just had me drooling yeah, at the thought of it. Really. Like he, he's already thought like he's he admitted like he's writing down notes while watching games, and like that is another reason. You know he plays. My, you know he plays football manager as the U.S. Men's National Team. Yeah, right. And and that that's the there, there's something to be said about passion, especially into hosting a World Cup. Yeah that could be advantageous. And that's where he is one of my favorite, favorite options for sure. Is that passion is unquestionable. Absolutely. Well, guys, that's been this episode of the planet soccer podcast. Uh, We will be back again with our second candidate. Dylan and I will decide who we're going to talk about. Let us know what you guys think in the comments, love, hate, or otherwise send it in. Uh, You'll have a great day, night, evening, morning, whatever. Come home, Jesse. You are doing right now. And we'll talk to y'all later. Come on.